Welcome to the Modern Medicine Movement Podcast with Dr. Thomas Hemingway. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said to yourself, I thought I'd be healthier, in better shape, feel better both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and be further along in my life? If so, come on this journey with my dad as he explores all things health and wellness from a holistic, medical perspective, even as a classically trained physician. He'll share integrative strategies to optimize health and inspire you to join the modern medicine movement. Hey, welcome, 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 welcome to the modern medicine movement podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Super pumped, super grateful. It's a beautiful day in Hawaii. And oh my gosh, I got just an amazing podcast today. So much amazing information, practical, simple, and largely, you know, free advice in the sense that the little action steps I'm going to recommend, almost all of them cost nothing, (laughs) yet they can greatly enhance, greatly improve your quality of life by these simple biohacks, if you will. (laughs) So I'm all about simple. I'm all about free. I'm all about things that are replicatable, duplicatable, easy to do. So I can't wait to share this podcast with you. It's something that we all (laughs) have been dealing with since our first day of life. And we tend to do and pass one thing third of our entire lifetimes doing this one thing. So let's make it count. <laughs> Excuse me, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, think about what that is. But, but so grateful for you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. I can't wait to share with you my recent review. And, and I just got to say, I love, love, love reading your reviews. So please, if you haven't done so already, Super simple, super easy. Go to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, uh, wherever you listen, Google Podcasts, what have you, Spotify. Write me a review. I read every single one of them. On Apple Podcasts, super easy. Just scroll down to where you see the five stars. Click on the star farthest to the right, five stars. And then you click on the little link below. There's like that little page with the little pencil on there, you know, going off to the right. And click on that link and then just type a little something. Just tell me what you're enjoying, what you're learning. Just, uh, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for doing that. It takes a few seconds, but it really, really helps get the word out. We've had thousands of downloads, and I can't wait to see that number hit a million one day, and hopefully not into the too far distant future. So so keep up the awesome work, um, taking time for yourselves, for your bodies, for your health, for your life, And share the good word. If you find any value here, please share, friends, family, whoever might benefit. Really appreciate you guys. Also, if you don't know about it already, I have a free, once again, that magic word, right? I have a free Facebook group. Uh, It's called Modern Medicine Movement Health and Wellness Group. And you can request to join. I pretty much uh, approve everybody uh, universally there. Um, and it's, it's an awesome little group. I put uh, special content, posts. I do lives on there, do some, you know, little uh, trainings or, or just, just speak on different health topics, you know. Um, it's, it's awesome. So, so join in, and you can also send me feedback there. Super easy. If there's uh, information you want to hear about, you can also email me at uh, Modern Medicine Movement Podcast at Gmail, or you can reach out to me on Instagram at Modern Medicine Movement Podcast, or at Aloha Surf Doc, or on Facebook, uh, Modern Medicine Movement, um, or just my regular personal page, Thomas Hemingway. So, anyway, um, thank you guys for for listening, taking the time out. I'm super pumped, super excited. Uh, uh, this is a topic that. I'll be honest, it's been a little tough for me. It's uh, not something I've done well <laughs> over the years. And uh, I actually made a quick post. I had a pretty shoddy internet from my car. I was sitting in my driveway, and I think it was trying to connect with my home Wi-Fi and couldn't decide, you know, that versus cellular. So I think I, I, think I just realized why it was so choppy. But I posted uh, a comment that said, uh, 
this one bad habit I have um, may make me die young. <laughs> I sure hope not, but but this one thing I'm about to talk about, which is our sleep. If we don't do a good job at it, we can, unfortunately, actually die young. And it's been proven in numerous ways as far as if we don't get good sleep, not enough sleep, not good quality sleep, you know, it puts us at risk for all sorts of health conditions, which in turn can certainly uh, facilitate our, our early demise, which is, which is not what we want. We want to live full, live long, you know, do like my, my buddy Spock, right? <laughs> live long and prosper. How do you do the little Vulcan thing, you know, something like that? <laughs> live long and prosper, right? We want to do that. We want to live a full life, a long life, and I'm actually sleeping better will help. Believe it or not, it will help, not just in the moment and, and to be rested, rejuvenated, refreshed, and to enjoy and live a fuller life, but we'll actually live longer if we sleep well. So can't wait to share with you a few tidbits and pearls, and, and I'll be honest with you, um, I was <laughs> one of the worst offenders in the uh, not sleeping enough, not sleeping probably well enough, not uh, valuing my sleep for decades, unfortunately. <laughs> as a college student, as a medical student, as a medical resident, I mean, I guess it's not too hard to believe that uh, you know, I didn't value my sleep because all the influences around me also did not value my sleep, right? They wanted me up and working, you know, 120-hour work weeks as a resident. They wanted me to be studying ridiculous quantities of material to be able to regurgitate them in medical school and college and all these things. So it's no big surprise that I didn't value my sleep because nobody else did either. <laughs> in fact, uh, I got to share with you one of the funny things that one of my professors in medical school, super bright guy. He taught me neurology. He was both a, a scientist as well as a practicing clinician, a neurologist. He worked at the VA hospital in San Diego. Super bright guy. Loved his neurology course. But, you know, one day we were talking about sleep. And I asked him, so, you know, why do we have to sleep anyway? Like, why? Why can't we just do what I do and sleep, you know, four hours a night or less and, and you know, uh, have the mantra that I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> That's been my mantra for two decades until the last couple of years when I have really appreciated the value of sleep. You know, have you guys ever heard that uh, Cure song, you know, the group The Cure? Oh, man, I love those guys in the 80s. They were like my high school band. <laughs> I think I even had a shirt you know, that said the cure, you know, I love those guys. And one of their songs, more recent ones was sleep when you're dead. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think it really works that way. But uh, that was my mantra for decades. And, and part of it was because I didn't appreciate the utility, the usefulness, the benefits of sleep, because I thought I was just getting by just fine on my four hours of sleep, which I was getting for you know, college, medical school, residency, way too long, way too many years. And it, uh, <laughs> you can't do that forever and it ain't good for you. And I don't want to die young. I want to live a, a full life. And one of the ways to do that is to maximize and optimize your sleep. So we're going to talk all about that today. Super pumped. Oh my gosh. It's just something that is near and dear to my heart because I've been, like I said, the worst offender over the years. So <laughs> I've had plenty of crappy uh, no sleep or, or little and, and uh, interrupted sleep uh, and sleepless nights. You know, I, as most of you know, I'm, I'm an emergency physician and ER doctor and I got to work at night sometimes, you know, I got to be up all night, you know, <laughs> like the song goes, right? My kids listen to that boy band, right? One Direction, up all night, you know, <laughs> and go figure. I was driving home from work um, after working late, you know, a night, and uh, that song comes on my wife's playlist. You know, I was in her car and <laughs> that song comes on and I'm preparing for this podcast. So it just, it just cracked me up, you know, I... I don't want to be up all night for, for obvious reasons. I want to be supine. I want to be catching my Z's, you know, and I want to figure out how to do that in the most effective, 
uh, way. So I'm going to share with you a lot of pearls that I've learned from both personal experience, shared patient experience. You know, I've been a practicing clinician now working in hospitals, ERs, and so forth for over 20 years. Isn't that cool? I started working in hospitals more than 20 years ago. So I got a breadth of experience. I got a lot of life experience. I got six kids and they can mess with your sleep too. So <laughs> we'll talk about all of those things. So super pumped. Um, I did an earlier podcast that talked a lot about kind of the cyclical nature of our bodies and our lives uh, with respect to what's called the circadian rhythm and how that's so important. And so I'm not going to get all into the, uh, you know, mechanisms and biochemical pathways and the melanopsin in the back of our retina that that basically senses the light and even blind people have these receptors. So circadian rhythm is important in everyone, even those that are blind, because we notice when it's light outside and when it's not. And for thousands and maybe, you know, many millennia, We've responded to those cues, and it's only recently in the last 100 years, you know, that we've had all this artificial light that we've jacked with that. So we need to go back to nature. We need to go back to, you know, light during the day, you know, being exposed to outdoor light as much a natural light, and then dark during the night. And, you know, we'll talk all about that. But why do we need to sleep? I didn't answer that question yet. Well, what I learned was we don't know why. We just know that if you don't sleep, you got a lot of problems, right? <laughs> they didn't know exactly what was happening during sleep. We knew that you needed sleep in the seven to eight hour, seven to nine hour figure has been tossed around for decades. And they didn't used to really know what was going on during sleep. Like what was so helpful? Why did you actually need to sleep? Like that's a third of our lives. I'd rather be surfing or reading or learning. Like why the heck do I have to sleep? Well, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. But we know what happens if you don't sleep, right? And if you don't sleep well, it jacks with you. There's so many things that it messes with, right? A lot of, a lot of stuff that I mentioned at the outset, chronic disease uh, uh, incidents, you know, uh, the frequency of it goes up a lot with things like hypertension, heart disease, a lot of different cancers. Obesity is related in a lot of ways to sleep. And this is fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And I may actually devote an entire podcast to this, how sleeplessness or trouble sleeping, poor sleep, lack of sleep, how that can affect obesity. And there's lots of mechanisms, you know, how you can maybe learn to lose that, you know, that, that stubborn 10 pounds just by sleeping better. Like, what? How does that happen? Well, you can do that. It's, there's, there's a lot of metabolically active things that your body can do at night and sleeping helps all those processes, and it's just super fascinating. But we also know that when we don't sleep well, we get sick. You know, our immune cells don't function well. Our natural killer cells don't function well. And uh, we know that this can change literally overnight. You know, you pull a couple all-nighters, and then you go on a long trip, you know, because you're packing, you're getting ready, you're prepared. What happens first thing you show up? You're sick. I've seen that literally thousands of times in my work as an emergency physician right here in Hawaii, ne, in Hawaii. You know, lots of folks come to visit, and a lot of them come uh, somewhat sleep deprived. And, you know, they get here and they get sick. It happens. But the cool thing is, your immune function can improve and change so quickly if you get well rested. It's like a night and day difference. So, you know, right now it's in the, still during this COVID pandemic and everybody's trying to talk about how to get healthy and do improve our immune health and things like that. And, and a lot of the lay press says you can't do it quickly, so don't even try, you know, just eat comfort foods, binge watch Netflix and that's garbage. That could not be farther from the truth. <coughs> Sorry, I got a dry mouth here. Um, that could not be farther from the truth. There is so much you can do, and so quickly can your immune system improve. Literally, it can improve overnight with a good, restful, high-quality sleep. So don't listen to the hype. 
that you can't do much to improve your immune function. That's just not simply, simply not true. It's garbage. Anyway, um, I once tried that, you know, that up all night thing. I once tried it and uh, I was in college and there was some kind of a midterm or final. It was in like a history class or something. I had some classmates that I guess did these kind of things. I, I never really did all nighters. Um, and, you know, I thought, well, this one particular test I hadn't been studying for as much as I should. So maybe I'll do this all nighter with them. I'll just try it out. And it was a stinking disaster. <laughs> I did not ace the test like I was used to acing my exams. Like this one, I was up all night. I studied crazily, and it didn't work because I'll get to it in a moment. But when you don't sleep well, you can't retain new knowledge. You don't establish memories very well. And I didn't know that way back when. <laughs> I didn't know that. But what I did know is that I usually did not. I almost never did any all-nighters because I didn't find them effective. I didn't know why they weren't effective. I just knew they didn't really work for me. So anyway, there's so much utility for good high quality sleep. It affects so many things. It affect, you know, affects our energy. It affects our ability to learn, um, our concentration, our exercise performance, our mood, all these kinds of things, you know, it's just amazing. And when we don't sleep well, all these things just go down the toilet. <laughs> I mean, even our hormone levels um, drop off. You know, lots of guys have low T, you know, lots of gals have problems with estrogen and progesterone. And, and these hormones can't work well if we're not sleeping. You know, also adrenal fatigue, you've heard of that. A lot of that messes with your sleep. And if you don't sleep well, the hormones are messed up. So <laughs> sleep is such an easy, simple thing that affects so many functions in our body. And we can improve our health quickly, dramatically, and fairly easily with getting good, natural, high quality sleep. And we'll talk all about that. Because if we don't, there's this whole list of things that we just don't want. So Let's get back to it. Why do we sleep in the first place? Why do we have to sleep? You know, it's a third of our lives spent in the bed with their eyes closed, semi-conscious, like, what the heck? Why do we need to do this? Well, as mentioned in medical school 20 plus years ago for me, I didn't learn it. They didn't know it. But recently in the last 10 years, there's been lots of research, lots of data. There's a dude by the name of Jeff, Dr. Jeff uh, Illif. He's a PhD out of the University of Washington currently. I think he was at OHSU prior to that, but he's done lots of work on the brain. He's a neuroscientist, and he was one of the folks that helped discover why we sleep, and it's fascinating. There's a couple of uh, TED Talks that he's done. Check him out. Um, Dr. Jeff Illiff. It's I-L-I-F-F. -F. He's done a lot of work with sleep. He's a cool dude, neuroscientist, and the work that I was fascinated with was with respect to this whole notion of the brain lymphatic system that they refer to as the glymphatic system with a G. G as in the cells of the brain are called the glia, G-L-I-A, the glial cells. And this system helps to basically refresh them, wash them, cleanse them, get rid of all the waste material that builds up because as... I've mentioned before the brain, although it's a small organ, relatively speaking, with you know size-wise or weight-wise for our bodies, is about two percent of our body weight. But it takes up twenty percent of the blood flow and the energy requirements and nutrients. Twenty percent. So where's this twenty percent of all the nutrients, waste products? Where the heck do they go? The brain is in basically a box. You know, our skull. Like how do the how do the you know, waste materials get out of there? Well, we know there's blood vessels going in there, but there's not really lymph vessels going out of there, not in the same way as the lymphatics of the rest of our body. So Dr. Illiff and his colleagues uh, studied this, and what they found is that there's a whole sort of microcirculation that's uh, responsible for cleansing, um, refreshing, rejuvenating the brain, getting rid of all the waste materials. 
And this is what they now refer to as the glymphatic system. And interestingly enough, this system is basically only active or primarily active while we're sleeping. While we're sleeping. You know, and he's got fancy pictures. There's even some videos online where you can watch um, these cells in the system at work during sleep. But when the eyes are open and wakefulness, this system's not doing much. So these waste products can build up. You've heard of uh, some of these um, proteins called tau and amyloid, which get deposited in those spaces in the brain between the cells, and they form these what they call neurofibrillary tangles, and they have been shown to be present in all sorts of dementia, from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's dementia, and all these things. And at night, if you're sleeping, it doesn't happen just because it's night, but if you're sleeping while you're sleeping, this whole cleansing mechanism, the glymphatic system, is hard at work. You're unconscious. You don't know about it. You're not thinking about it. <laughs> but these guys are working for you, and they're sweeping up all the debris. They're removing all the waste products, the messed up fibers that are there as byproducts. You know, the tau protein is actually used for an important function in the brain, the microtubules, uh, which is important. But sometimes there's kind of like waste products and, and messed up, you know, sort of defective uh, proteins that are formed, and all this needs to get flushed out. You know, the amyloid, the tau, you know, so you don't get Alzheimer's later. And this flushing, this cleansing, this rejuvenation, refreshing, it happens at night. And Dr. Jeff Illiff showed this just fabulously in his work. And he's got real-time pictures of, of how the circulatory system of the brain works to cleanse the brain. And it happens while we sleep. So we need to sleep because if we don't sleep, we're getting these proteins building up that these waste products, you know, the two that most of us have heard of, um, amyloid and tau and, and dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, uh, supranuclear uh, palsy, all these kinds of things. And that's because they're not getting removed and cleansed during this restorative process that we're supposed to spend a third of our lives doing. Sleeping, sleeping is important. So anyway, check out check out these cool videos online. Uh, Dr. Jeff Illiff, um, super fascinating stuff. Also, you know, with respect to, it's very interesting because um, I mentioned kind of briefly at the outset that one of the things that sleep helps us with is our memory, establishing permanent memories. And as most of us know, in dementia, especially Alzheimer's, etc., one of the first things we notice clinically is that people get more forgetful. They can't remember where they put things. They can't remember, you know, new data, new things. But, but they do remember, you know, how to walk. They do remember how to put a spoon in their mouths and eat, you know, up until the end when they're really bad off. But but the procedural memory, you know, walking, eating, you know, doing these kinds of things is stored in, in primarily a different area of the brain than that which is primarily affected in these dimensions. And that's the procedural and kind of motor stuff is more in the cerebellar circuit, whereas the memory aspect, you know, trying to remember if you meet somebody, what their name is, you know, some new material that you've read or listened to on a podcast or whatever, those memories go into an area called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is one that gets a lot of these uh, amyloid accumulations. It primarily happens in the hippocampus, in the thalamus. And what's interesting, if they've done studies and looked at this, and actually as little as one night sleep loss, so you're up all night for one night, you start to notice, and this can actually be seen uh, with functional MRI and other imaging modalities and techniques, that your amyloid... Um, is accumulating in as little as one night that you don't sleep. This is crazy. This stresses me out. I mean, I, I, I work often at night. In fact, I got like seven night shifts coming up where I'm working late into the evening or all night long, and I'm not going to be sleeping. So I'm like, holy crap, I got to make sure I get my sleep during the day, and we'll talk about techniques to do that so that I can have this rejuvenation, this glymphatic system flushing all these nasty, you know, waste materials from the high metabolic rate that our brain has, getting rid of the tau and the amyloid and things so that 
I'm not at risk for Alzheimer's and other dementias and things because I'm going to work hard to get my sleep. It's so, so, so important. So this is super cool, super interesting. It can be noticed, these deposits, in as little as one night of no sleep. And that's according to some researchers at the National Institutes of Health. I'll put the, uh, put the link in the show notes. It's really, really interesting. They use some PET scanning, and we're able to see this established uh, in as little as one night missed. And so... It's just, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. So we got to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> it's restorative. It's rejuvenative. And it's literally, it's the housekeeping that keeps our brains healthy and alive via this uh, glymphatic system. And as just mentioned, it helps us establish memories, right? And so that was what happened to me when I was in college. And I pulled this all-nighter. Although immediately, if you would have asked me while I was up, I probably could have told you this stuff. But the next day, I had no idea. I couldn't remember because I didn't give my brain time to establish or cement, you know, those memories in to the hippocampal region because that happens during sleep. That's when it happens. It's not happening at other times. So, that's what really screwed me up. I, I couldn't remember stuff because of that. So, so good, high-quality sleep is so, so important to memory and establishing new memories and learning. And it's just so cool, so, so cool. Like I said, that's in the hippocampal region. Um, and then in contradistinction, the procedural memory is more in sort of the um, cerebellar region. So usually even folks with Alzheimer's will preserve that for quite some time, which is very, very interesting. So, you know, one common example of, of uh, sleep deprivation is one, guess what, in the medical profession, right? There's what's called the medical intern. That's your first year being a full-fledged doctor. Like after you finish medical school, you basically spend basically an entire year in the hospital, you know, doing different uh, specialties, internal medicine, you know, surgery, what have you. I did this, uh, spent, I think, four months in general surgery, four or five months in internal medicine, one month radiology, a uh, month of orthopedics, a month of plastic surgery. You know, I did all these specialties, a month of OBGYN. And basically, I was up all night or, or sleeping very little, you know, working 100 plus hours a week this whole year. And and it wasn't good. It wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for my patients. You know, sleep deprivation causes mistakes. It causes errors. It causes a state akin to being drunk, right? It's been clinically shown that if you're sleeping less than six hours a night for many nights on end, even as little as for one week of six hour nights back to back to back to back, you're basically having intoxication, not by a substance, not by alcohol or a drug, but you perform and behave as if you were intoxicated. And it's, it's crazy. And it's been shown, there's a study in interns that talks about, you know, the error rate, uh, 36% more serious errors were occurring in interns on a schedule that were up for more than 24 hours at a time. 36, it's a third more error. So make sure your doctors are getting appropriate sleep. You don't want them to be having the one out of three chance to make a mistake or an error on you. Don't be that person. Don't let your doctor be that person. <laughs> so we know that good sleep, it can minimize this, right? It can help us problem solve. It can enhance our memory. And if we don't sleep, well, it impairs our brain function. That's pretty obvious. And, and another thing for all those real uh, fit, you know, sort of, you know, exercisers out there, we know that exercise improves um, I'm sorry, sleep improves your exercise performance as well. So now let's get down to the nuts and bolts, the practical aspects. How the heck do we get a good night's sleep? How do we do it? Well, there's a whole list. <laughs> so let's talk about some really important things. First of all, you got to kind of decide what type of sleeper are you? And this has uh, been described as what's called a chronotype. You know, are you a day person? Are you more of a mid-shift person? Are you a night person? You know, when do you thrive? When do you do well? I've always been an early morning guy. I think it has something to do with the fact that I love to surf. I love, love, love to get up early to see the sunrise, be surfing as I see the sunrise, or be on the mountain and see the sunrise. I just like to be outside 
when the sun comes up. Did you guys ever see that movie a long time ago called The City of Angels? I think there's a couple of scenes in there where all the folks are at the beach watching the sunrise, you know, <laughs> kind of a weird movie, but, but I, that's me. I'm that guy that's out there watching the sunrise outside, seeing it, getting the natural light, appreciating the immense beauty. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. So basically what I need to do is I need to adjust my schedule as best I can to fit that. You know, if I'm going to be up every morning at 5 a.m., I need to be in bed at the latest at 10 o'clock at night. I got to get my seven hours of beauty sleep, right? Some of us need eight. Some of us may need nine, but somewhere between seven and nine is the recommendation. And for me, I'm going to need to be lights out in bed by 10 p.m. or it just ain't going to work because <laughs> I love to get up early. So you got you to gotta figure out you know, what time is going to be your best to optimize your chronotype if you're a morning person, a night person, whatever it is. And then you got to stick to the schedule. You got to do it. You got to get up every day, go to bed every day. You got to do this day in, day out, weekends included. Uh, you know, you can mess around a day a week on a weekend if you want to go catch a movie with your wife or stay up a little later on one night or whatever. I get that. I do it. I do it myself. I got a stinking work overnight. But for the most part, try to set a schedule. Make it pretty rigid where you get up at a certain time, you go to bed at a certain time. Routine is everything. And I think especially you guys that have kids, yeah, you, you feel me? You know what I'm talking about? If you got kids, routine is literally everything. You got to get those guys in bed at a certain time because if you don't and you're lazy about it or it just doesn't happen, guess what? 6 a.m. rolls around. They don't care that they went to bed at midnight. They're up and they're ready to go. Like, <laughs> And maybe they'll be a little more crabby and cranky too. <laughs> but the reality is routine is so, so important. Super, super important. So get a routine going. Try to do the same uh, morning you know, ritual. Get up at the same time. Go to bed at the same time. Every single day, seven days a week. So, so important. Super important. Routine is paramount. The next thing um, to really figure out is the environment where you're sleeping, your bedroom needs to be a certain way. It's got to be dark. Number one, it's been shown in studies that the darker the bedroom, the more restful sleep, the more easy it is to get into that um, slow wave sleep and then to REM sleep. And these are where you're really getting the maximization of your restorative processes. So if you got a nightlight, get rid of the nightlight. You don't need a nightlight. Um, you know, have blackout curtains, super important. My wife and I have invested in those. <laughs> Makes a big difference. In fact, we're, we're even paying to have some like fancy, you know, shade kind of blackouts to really make it dark because I, I was suffering from it. I mean, even though I like to get up early, like if it's a full moon outside, it's hard to sleep like that, that full moon penetrates and it lights up my room and it's going to be a full moon. I think tomorrow, <laughs> So if you can't get the blackouts going, get some eye shades, you know, those uh, sleep shades. You got to have it dark. Super important. You got to have the temperature right. You know, the studies have shown somewhere between 65 and 68 degrees is sort of that magic number. And this is something that you and your partner may kind of squabble about. I know my wife likes it warm. I like it cold. I like the window open. She likes it shut. You know, it's, it can be a challenge. So I'm actually looking into one of those pads that you can sleep on. So I can dial mine down pretty cold, and then, you know, she can, she can be warm if she wants. But getting the temperature right is really important because your body naturally to fall asleep needs to drop up to 2 degrees, the uh, body temperature. And so naturally you want it to be cooler. So somewhere between... 65 and 68 tends to be what the studies show, you know, try to get it at least, you know, down to 70 if you and your your partner squabble about it. That's kind of, we've come to that magic number. I didn't get my 65, but <laughs> happy wife, happy life, right? I, true dat, we've been married 22 years and that's my mantra. But anyway, I digress. So, so temperature is important. Um, the whole routine, super, super important. You know, you shouldn't really be eating uh, within a few hours of sleep. Um, my mantra is around three hours. Try not to eat within three hours. If you do, try to keep it to satiating kinds of stuff, either high protein or high fat, like nix the carbs. So I had to stop eating ice cream at night. Like I eat ice cream occasionally because I love the taste, but now instead of eating it, 
late at night after work, I try to eat it at lunchtime. You know, I still love the taste of it. I just rarely eat it, and I try not to eat it at night. So try to avoid carbs at night, no late-night snacks. This is super beneficial not only for sleep but for circadian rhythm issues, the whole intermittent fasting thing, and, and spicing up our metabolism relies on giving our gut time to rest as well. Just as we need rest for our body, our mind, our soul, restorative rejuvenative functions of the brain, we need rest for our gut too. So don't don't make your gut work at night. Don't get up and get a snack. If you're hungry, just have a glass of water. You know, just fill that stomach, but not with food. <laughs> not in the middle of the night, okay? Um, also, you know, exercise is awesome for, you know, getting awesome sleep. You know, if you've got kids, if they've been rough and tumble all day long outdoors, like, they're going to sleep like a baby, right? They're going to sleep well. So I encourage exercise. Six for six, that's my wife's mantra. I'm trying to follow suit and exercise six days a week at a minimum. I usually even walk on the seventh day too, but nothing intense. That helps us to sleep better, but just don't do it right before bed, right? Exercise animates us. It gets the you know, this, the, the cortisol going, our epinephrine, our adrenaline, norepinephrine, you know, our endocannabinoids, all these things are pumping and you're lively exercise. You know, I do exercise at night only if I have a project that I have to finish and I'm getting, you know, maybe a little sleepy. I just, okay, I'm going to do five minutes of curls. I'm going to do five minutes of push-ups or whatever. And that kind of spices it up and gets me, gets me awake and stuff like that. But <laughs> generally speaking, don't exercise within a couple hours uh, before bedtime. And within an hour before bedtime, this goes with all this uh, environmental stuff, like no TV, no cell phone, no tablet. Like, get the light out. No light, no light. <laughs> and this has to do with, you know, the whole circadian rhythm thing. Like, if we're soaking in a bunch of blue light at night, we're totally jacking our, our circadian rhythm. Our bodies think that it's still daytime. You know, that's where these kind of blue blocking glasses come in. If you must be up, you know, a little later working on a project, Set your phone, tablet, computer to sort of the dark night mode where it's, you know, more of a yellow hue and not the bright blues and stuff like that. And then wear these glasses. There's lots of different types of blue blockers out there. Um, but at all costs, if you can avoid it, try not to be on the computer or not to watch TV. Like a lot of people fall asleep with the TV on. Not a good idea. <laughs> Even if you think once you're asleep it doesn't matter. It matters. Your body notices. Your skin notices. Your pineal gland notices. And it can't secrete the appropriate amounts of melatonin, which help you to get to sleep and stay asleep. And if you're doing too much blue light in the night, you're messing with that. And you're going to suffer from it. So no blue lights, no TVs, iPads, tablets, cell phones, you know, within an hour or so of bedtime. And then leave that stuff out of the room. For that reason, the blue light reason, so you're not tempted to keep looking at it and all that kind of stuff. Plus, many of you guys have heard of EMFs, you know, electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields, and they are basically given off by anything that gets plugged in, right? By our cell phones, our TVs, our microwaves, our lights, anything that's plugged in is basically creating an electromagnetic field. And if our bodies are exposed to these fields 24 7, Without a break ever, this has been shown to increase our risk for a lot of conditions, including cancer. So, you know, I'm not dogmatic about, you know, not using a cell phone, but I try to turn it off at night, put it on airplane mode, and then put it in a different room, like decrease, give your body a break, you know, let it have at least eight hours where it's not soaking in all the EMF and having the cell phone on the nightstand, even if it's on vibrate or whatever, that doesn't count. Just get the phone out of the room. You know, get your EMF down, get the light that, you know, if you got notifications making it light up or buzz or whatever, just get the phone out of the room. Nobody's dying. You know, even the hard thing for me was as a physician, I, I was chief of the ER for over 10 years and my phone never got turned off. Even when I was on vacation, it was on. And now that I've retired from that management position, I'm so grateful because I can turn my phone off at night. It's amazing. <laughs> Turn the phone off. Anyway, um, also to have good sleep, we need to have a time to kind of prepare for it. You know, so in that one hour, you're like, what the heck am I going to do if I turn my phone off an hour before bed? What am I going to do for a whole hour? Oh, my gosh. 
Let me give you a big fat list. You can read. You can meditate. You can pray. You can spend time with your partner. Whatever that is, using that time to de-stress and to kind of calm your mind, to quiet those voices in your head is so important. Have you guys ever had that feeling where you lay down and you're like, oh my gosh, I just got this list of all these things in my head that I need to do or that I didn't do and maybe I got to write them all down and then like your mind is racing and like, how the heck are you ever going to go to sleep? You know what puts me to sleep each and every time? I just grab a book. (laughs) I just grab a book and start reading, have the light real dim on purpose. I, I have actually one of those little you know, those little uh, headlamps that's got like the red light setting that you can use if you're developing photos. So it doesn't mess with the blue light. It's not messing with me. Um, doesn't ma- mess with my night vision. And I read, <laughs> I read a book with those little red lights on and it's cool. I love it. And, um, you know, I usually do that if like my wife's got to be up working a little later or whatever. And so I'm trying to kind of just chill and, and read my book or whatever. And, and so just a little time to de-stress from the day, super important. You know, meditation, um, all these things, prayer, quiet time, uh, snuggle time with your wife, husband, significant other. That actually has been shown, believe it or not, to improve your sleep. Like it's, it's there. It's on the list. There's scientific data on it. So have a snuggle and then go to sleep. I mean, there's lots of, lots of good, good stuff in there. Um, other things with this whole routine you want to avoid you know, having caffeine at night, like don't have that cup of coffee with your dinner, like bad idea, at least as far as if you want to sleep that night, alcohol, you shouldn't consume alcohol within a couple hours of sleep because alcohol, though it may make you tired, may make you a little bit sleepy. It's not quality sleep. It actually messes with your sleep. It doesn't allow you to get to REM sleep. So it's crummy. Don't do it. Don't do it. If you have to and you need to and you've tried all these other things, you've got a great routine going, your bed is your, you know, bedroom is your sanctuary, it's quiet, there's no distractions, it's dark, you still can't get to sleep. You know, there are some herbs that can help you. I'm not going to really go into that today. There's a whole list of things. The ones that I personally take are magnesium uh, because it's natural. And if you don't want to buy a supplement, don't buy a supplement. Just get it in your green leafy vegetables. Lots of magnesium there. Magnesium is so soothing. It's so natural. It's probably the most underappreciated um, natural mineral and one of the most commonly deficient uh, ones, or, or I should say the most common deficiencies amongst all of us is a magnesium deficiency. Most of us don't even know it. But having proper magnesium will help with a hundred things. One of them is sleep. For me, it helps me also with my migraines. I get migraines. Magnesium is amazing to help with that. Helps calm us. It's a natural sort of calm, um, calming uh, reagent. So magnesium is my favorite. There's also melatonin. I talked a little bit more about that on my circadian rhythm. So just refer back to that. If you must use it, it works best if you're resetting your clock, if you're traveling and there's jet lag and things. And try to use the smallest effective dose. You know, start with something small like two milligrams. Um, There's a few others out there that have been shown to be helpful, something called valerian root, um, L-theanine, lavender, chamomile, you know, a few of those things. Um, So, yeah, there's definitely some, some additional helps out there, natural helps. But do your best to, you know, the way I look at it is... The most effective thing for sleep is what you can do naturally and behaviorally because your body needs all that. You know, if you just take a little pill, like a sleeping pill, which, by the way, they do not produce effective sleep. You know, all the ones out there, Ambien and and all the 10 others, do not produce high quality sleep. They'll, they'll get you to, you know, be eyes closed, but it's not restful. You may be groggy. It's not restorative. It's not the kind of sleep your body needs, craves, and wants. You don't get into those deeper stages, the deep, you know, slow wave sleep where the memories are established or the REM sleep. Um, you're not getting to those, those levels very well with these either over-the-counter agents, things like Unisom, Benadryl, all those things, not, not awesome. Prescription medications for sleep, also not awesome. The most effective and most awesome is what we can do behaviorally. And I've seen that in thousands of people over the last 20 years, including in myself. 
So practice the behavioral things because they're effective and they're free, right? I love it. And they're free. You know, other things that can help you, um, you can uh, do a warm bath at night. My, my wife likes to do this from time to time. It's relaxing. I, I get in the hot tub, you know, at night. I love getting in the hot tub at night. It just kind of settles me from the day, you know, helps my near 50-year-old back that's been subject to a lot of wear and tear, <laughs> you know, surfing, skateboarding, snowboarding, you know, lots of yard work on our three acres here in Hawaii, you know. <laughs> I mean, I love the hot tub. It's soothing. It's relaxing. Um, you know, those, those things can be helpful. Uh, try not to, I mentioned this, try not to snack, try not to eat before bed, and also try not to drink a bunch of water before bed, right? You don't want to be up and peeing all night. We've talked about this recently, but drink your big glass of water in the morning when you first get up, okay? Don't drink a big tall glass of water right before you go to bed because I'm, I'm your best witness of that. It, I got to get up and pee a few times if I do that. So at the end of the day, let's focus on these simple behavioral changes that we can do that are free. And I promise you, if you, you may not be able to do all these the first night, but if you work on a couple of these at a time and you get to where you got your sleep environment perfect, it's totally blacked out and dark, you can't see your, you know, hand in front of your face, and then you know you've got it. You know, turn off all the lights, night lights, get rid of the distractions, make it quiet, make it cool, you know, do the other things that get you ready for sleep, you know, no exercise, no alcohol, no food, you know, maybe just a sip of water, rest, relax, meditate, pray, snuggles, whatever, you know, have that restful time before bed, and it's going to make a huge difference. You know, it's just you will be blown away at how much better you will sleep and how much better you will feel the next day. Energized, refreshed, metabolically, I mean, it's just unreal how much benefit you're going to get for this. So my goal, and I hope it's yours too, is to do these simple, practical, behavioral things so that I can get my restful seven, eight hours of sleep so that my brain has a chance to flush, rejuvenate, cleanse, get rid of all these nasty byproducts of metabolism, the tau proteins, the amyloid, all this crap that builds up from, you know, how active our mind is. I mean, 20% of our energy requirement is used by 2% of our body weight, which is our brain. Like, that's a lot of waste material we got to get rid of. And the only time that really effectively happens is while we sleep. So here's to you guys. Here's to great sleep. It's something super, super simple. It's not something hard. It's something that's largely free, which I... I love, I love free. Free is the best price, right? These biohacks, life hacks, sleep hacks are going to be the world of difference for you and your life. And I can't wait to tell you more about how sleep affects metabolism, how we can lose weight while we sleep. Like, who doesn't want to lose weight while they sleep? I'll spend a whole podcast, I think, in the future talking about how it all works. It's amazing stuff. So... For now, here's to you, to your sleep, to your refreshed, rejuvenated self that's going to wake up every morning ready to tackle the world because you've had an amazing, amazing sleep. I love you guys. Reach out to me, Modern Medicine Movement Podcast at gmail.com, at Aloha Surf Doc. Look me up, Modern Medicine Movement Health and Wellness Facebook group. Can't wait to connect you with you. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for leaving a review. I love you guys. This is why I do this. So a big aloha.